Welcome to I Love to Tell a Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for September 22nd, 2024. We're in uh, week three of the Narrative Lectionary selections for, uh, for this year. And we've moved uh, to Genesis 37. So last week we were in Genesis, 15, Genesis 15, and we realized we've skipped a lot here, but uh, uh, in other years of the narrative lectionary, we talk about uh, uh, Isaac and Jacob. So don't worry about that. Uh, this year we're moving from God's promises uh, to Abraham in Genesis 15. Uh, to God's work in the life of Joseph and God's promises to Joseph uh, in uh, this really kind of small novella of Genesis 37 through 50. Uh, and obviously we're not, uh, that's a long story uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to talk about, uh, but we're highlighting the very beginning of that story and the very end of that story, which are closely related to each other. They, they provide bookends for the whole story of Joseph. Uh, so let me just uh, um, remind you, uh, of course, uh, uh, of what we skipped over. So uh, uh, eventually, of course, God's promise to Abraham is fulfilled, bo- uh, both in the birth of Ishmael, but then especially in the birth of Isaac. Uh, and Isaac, uh, God um, commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That's a whole podcast in itself, or probably uh, uh, several podcasts. Uh, uh, Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Isaac marries Rebecca and has Jacob and Esau. That's a whole uh, long story as well, the story of Jacob. But then eventually we get into the story of God's promises being fulfilled in Jacob's family. So uh, uh, in Jacob, we see the be- really the, the, the kind of firm uh, beginning of that promise of offspring, that promise to Abraham way back in Genesis 12, that he would be the father of a great nation. Well, we don't really see that coming to fruition really until the story of Joseph uh, and his brothers. So uh, Jacob has 12 sons, including Joseph the uh, from his beloved wife, Rachel. Uh, and Joseph and his, uh, at, at the beginning of the story, probably still just 11 brothers, uh, uh, sorry, probably just 10 brothers, uh, uh, they uh, are in conflict with, with one another. And of course, we see this throughout the book of Genesis. You see uh, the the problem of the brother, Walter Brueggemann, old, uh, old Testament scholar, talks about this as the problem of the brother, right? It's okay to be in relationship, you know, just me and God, but I have to deal with the brother or the sister uh, in the case of uh, of Rachel and Leah. Uh, so uh, Joseph, uh, when we meet him in chapter 37, is a young man. He's just 17 years old, and that maybe tells us a lot about Joseph, right? Like uh, 17-year-old boys, no offense, Rolf, but 17-year-old boys, uh, you know, don't tend to be maybe the wisest uh, or or most generous, uh, maybe, uh, of human beings. And so Joseph kind of... Um, lives up to that. He He's the favorite of his father. He's given this coat, this special coat by his father, Jacob. Uh, uh, whether you want to translate that a coat with long sleeves or the coat of many colors, uh, it's obvious that uh, Jacob or Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children, it says uh, in verse 3. Joseph adds to this, uh, and the brothers realize this. Of course, they're jealous of Joseph. Then Joseph has this pair of dreams. He's unwise enough to tell them, uh, tell these dreams to his family, and so his brothers hate him even more. And so then, uh, when he's sent to uh, to his brothers uh, in uh, verse twelve uh, and following, uh, they plot to kill him. I just want to say one more note about that, and then uh, I'll. I'll uh, uh, ask you guys to to uh, talk about what you're thinking about this story. I, I had the great good fortune this summer of traveling with my family uh, to Memphis, Tennessee, and we went to the National Civil Rights Museum, which is uh, built uh, partly in the Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King mm-hmm. Jr. was assassinated uh, in 1968. 
uh, and then uh, there's a there's a whole other building attached to that motel. But they there's a there's a large wreath uh, on the balcony where MLK was uh, was shot uh, from a building across the street. There's a large wreath there, and there's a plaque in the courtyard right under that window that quotes uh, this passage in uh, Genesis 37, verse 19. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him. Uh, and then the, the plaque skips over the, uh, the next bit. Uh, and we shall see what will become of his dreams, is what the plaque says, right? Come now, let us kill him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now, I, that's just a... a a, uh, a beautiful use uh, or reuse of a scriptural passage, right? Because it fits so well with uh, with Martin Luther King uh, and particularly as his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, um, uh, one of the fellows who was there at the assassination of a uh, local pastor, whose name I'm forgetting right now, uh, said later, uh, you can kill the dreamer. You sure can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. And it seems like, uh, well, I mean, that's that's another story, I suppose. But it's just a a, a beautiful use of that passage, uh, and it shows again uh, God's promises in the face of human sin. Right? Uh, the brothers are jealous of Joseph. Uh, they they uh, uh, and they plot to kill him uh, to commit fratricide, uh, much as uh, Cain did to Abel. So lots of richness with this story. Uh, lots of ways you could go with it. I think the challenge of entering this story, especially uh, the, since we've included the ending piece from chapter 50, is uh, similar to like when you're pulling a passage out of the middle of Amos or Jonah, is you kind of have to preach the, the whole story um, or, it, or else don't include chapter yeah. 50. Um, and... Uh, as Catherine has pointed out, that the problem of the brother is different in every generation. So last week, the problem was we don't, uh, Abram and Sarai don't have a son. Then uh, when they uh, do, they've, uh, Abram eventually has two different sons, uh, and there's uh, various challenges uh, between um, Isaac and Ishmael. But then Isaac eventually has twins, so the question is which son? And now in the next generation, you've got the 11th son is somehow favored. And so family dysfunction, uh, you're not going to find a whole lot of role models uh, for, no. for uh, <laughs> Christian living uh, in the book of Genesis or in uh, actually most of the Bible. The story ends, though, um, with... Uh, the reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers, and he forgives them, but then their father Jacob dies. And so you get this moment, realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears us a grudge? This, the way guilt hangs on after forgiveness uh, is itself a problem. Um, and one of my teachers said, there's no sins Jesus loves forgiving more than old sins. But then they come to Joseph and they say, hey, uh, your father, interesting, gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, now, this isn't recorded anywhere in Genesis, so, so it's likely that we're to conclude they're making this up. Um, and uh, I love this phrase. Again, do not be afraid. As I mentioned last week, this means good news is going to follow. Am I in the place of God? even though you intended to do me harm or evil, and that word intend is the same one as last week uh, was uh, translated as reckoned, God intended it for good. That even though you intended through your sinning against me to harm me, God has entered in and changed the math. And so now it adds up to zero and forgiveness is the thing that equal, that, that is the great equalizer. I really appreciate your bringing in and holding to uh, wrapping it with uh, the, the chapter 50. So keeping aware the fullness of that story and these dynamics, the sibling dynamics. Uh, and uh, Catherine, your story just made me uh, just 
obviously for, for, for reasons that some might see as obvious if they're watching us, um, just strikes with me, particularly in our current cultural moment, because where we are right now is the need to recognize that the promises of the creator God for humanity are greater and um, more lasting than what any government or nation or group can offer us. And in the repetitive uh, flaws of humanity that we experience today, whether it is uh, our politics, our ethnicity, our class, uh, our history, our gender, uh, whatever it is, there's a need for the response of the people who trust God to be faithful, to say, I'm not going to stand in the place of God. I, You are doing this. It is the same evil we've seen so many generations before. It's happened over and over again. And yet in the faith that the people of God should claim we have in God's goodness, in God's provision, in God's intention, we will not harm the other, no matter how much the other has harmed and continues to and intends to continue to harm us. That's a difficult lesson. But if there's any hope for the world today, this story of Joseph and his capacity to forgive his brothers who can't behave better because, as you've said, Rolf, they can't let go of the guilt. That's between them and God. Joseph says, I trust God and I'm going to do what God has created me to be just to bear his image a glimpse of hope and horror.